everybody enjoy lunch? Good. I see nods. That's good. Pizza. Pizza's happy. Um, all right. So I have the Spark Talk before I introduce my buddy Patrick. And um, if you haven't already started following Jennifer Gonzalez and the Cult of Pedagogy, I highly recommend. Um, this is someone that you get on Twitter, or Facebook. Um, she posted something, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. Um, it was all the tech tools that you should try in 2019. And I have now been obsessed with one of the tools that she posted on here. And I thought, I'm going to use this as a spark because I think it's what we've tried to do. We, our students in Holland, I'm from Holland Central Schools, um, the educational innovator there. And my name is Michelle Krieger. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have done that first. <laughs> Um, so uh, our uh, high school and middle school have half an hour lunches, but we have 40 minute periods, so then we have this thing, 10 minute period, um, and we're always looking for like different brain breaks and different things like that. So um, I think this is going to be what I'm going to introduce to the kids next. Um, it's called GeoGuessr. Anybody out there a GeoGuessr? Oh my god, <laughs> obsessed. You just, was it because of my post? No. Oh. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. I love when people like my posts on Twitter, at Holland Tech Girl. That's me, so you can follow me. Um, so anyways, GeoGuessr, let me just go ahead and show you what GeoGuessr does. Okay, so basically it uses Google Earth and it just drops you anywhere, any street, any location in the world. Um, you, if you play challenger mode, you have to pay for it, right? Don't pay for it. You can just play single player. Um, and so like you press single player and boom, there you are and you have to figure out where you are. And then um, you make a guess by just scrolling where you think you are, right? So let's say I think I'm in Libya. What, what? How did you know that? Okay, that's, okay, so anyways, Mike is of course gonna hijack my spark talk. <laughs> You're not better than me. Um, <laughs> but he is. <laughs> Okay, so so the funny thing is that uh, yesterday I was playing this and without even thinking, I was 20 minutes into this w hard and I got two of my locations. The first one was obviously somewhere in Africa and yes, I could tell by the trees. But what you'll notice, like what kids will end up doing is just st start using some of their internet skills. Um, they'll start looking at maybe if you're dropped in a city, oops, there they are again, sorry. Um, if you're dropped in a city like I was yesterday, the first time I had been dropped in a city, other times I'm just like, like Mike you know, said, oh, you gotta look at trees, you gotta look at the animals there, you gotta, so you have to use all the clues around you, but you end up using like things like Google Translator and uh, Google Images and um, Google Copy, I don't know, there's, there's a ton of things that you end up using as tools to try to figure out where you are. So basically, they drop you, you can, um, let me go back. Oh, thanks. Somebody just liked me on Twitter. <laughs> okay. Let me go back to where I was. So, oh, oh, yep, resume my game. So, really, by that tree, you can tell that you're in, where did you say? Okay, I thought you were, but anyways, it's, it's a 360, right? So, you can, oh, ooh, see? So basically, you're just going to rotate around. You're going to use the arrows to help you go um, around and search and et cetera. So it's really, it's really kind of fun. So anyways, um, I don't know. that oh, For Christ's sakes. OK. There we go. Um, so anyways, you can make a guess. Well, um, now I changed my mind, because that kind of looked like a castle, right? I don't know. You think Spain? All right. Um, I, I don't have my glasses on. Hang on. There we go. So I drop a pin, and like you can move it, and it doesn't, okay, and make a guess. So basically what it'll do is give you points for how close you are. So it's calculating it. Um, what? I don't do that. Okay, so, oh, I was, I was off a little bit, it was Germany. Um, but your guess was uh, 1,782 kilometers away, so you do get points for even being as far away as I was. Highly addictive, super fun, great, easy thing to do for a brain break. Um, I've enjoyed it. So yesterday, I found that I was in Sao Paulo because they had the soccer club logo 
um, on one of the billboards that was in the city. So I didn't know what it was, so I just Googled it, and then I translated that site, and I found out it was in Sao Paulo, and then my computer went down, so I didn't even get to make my guess. But I'm over it, kind of not, because I just told you the story. But um, I'm going to go ahead, let you play with that, but please don't during Patrick's talk. Um, and I'm going to start to introduce Patrick. I need notes because he gave me a lot to talk about. Um, he has a lot to talk about. He's a very interesting man. Patrick is a new educational innovator in Holland Central Schools. He comes to us as a Google certified trainer, a quiz teacher ambassador, and he has also been innovating ways of integrating technology into his curriculum ever since he started teaching over 11 years ago and seeks out every opportunity to expand his skills. Patrick, where are you from? St. Gregory. Yes. So he came from us, from, um, from St. Gregory. Um, he has worked as a consultant both locally with NiceGate and BOCES and nationally with EdTech Team, working collaboratively with teachers to see the power of technology and the power it can have in the classroom. The recent highlights for Patrick's professional career are pretty impressive. Um, he was a guest blog for Matt Miller, and it rose to the top three on Google search and, um, teaching, and training teachers at Google headquarters in Chicago. Um, he has a wife, Sarah. He has two beautiful children, daughter, Caroline, and, and George. I was trying to think of an adjective for George. He's a scurry little kid. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Patrick McMillan. Mike's coming down. So I'll talk and fill in the gaps. Because as a teacher, this happens all the time to you, right? Where you're just like, oh, this didn't go as I planned. i got to try and fill this in right now and see if I can figure out plan B. Even though you didn't figure out plan B to begin with, you know, you're figuring it out on the spot. And that's really what we have to do as teachers is, is work on the spot and figure out um, a way to get around that issue that you're dealing with in the classroom. Um, so I wanted to start with um, talking about Roger, Roger's talk, where he was talking with Andy about coming to the TIFF talks and that there's really no structure for him to deal with. Um, Roger was looking for a framework to begin with. And I thought it was really awesome over the course of the talks today how they all actually kind of fit together. Um, and a lot of what the speakers talked about at the beginning of the day, I actually have in my presentation as well for you. Um, so I don't know what Shannon's going to do, but pressure's on Shannon because a lot of this stuff worked together for me to, to get today and it kind of came together. Um, I'll even talk about later on, I have something in my slides that just popped up on Google yesterday and we'll see how much you, you guys were paying attention to the Google homepage yesterday. Um, but I actually was able to insert that into my presentation today, which was really awesome. We'll see how this is going. So, all right, so I'll start with, um, so my opening question for you is, are you a great teacher? How do you know that you're a great teacher? And what does it take to get there? So I would argue that it's the little things that get you there. It's the little things that make a difference. It's the little things that make you relevant. And it's the little things that help you elicit change. So what I'm going to talk about today are teacher Easter eggs. And I'll talk about Easter eggs on the next slide in case you don't know. But I believe that those little things are really what you gather as a teacher beyond your first year of teaching as you're moving through. They're not necessarily things you're taught in teacher college, they're things you pick up along the way. And there are those important things that do those three things in your classroom. We'll see if the clicker works now. Oh, we're good. Okay, so in case you don't know, um, Easter eggs are usually used with gaming. Um, sometimes you'll find it in different kinds of media as well, but gaming is one of the big spots that you'll find Easter eggs. So they're those hidden things, um, hidden features in games that are revealed after repetition and exploration. So they're the things you're not going to find the first time around, 
They're things that reveal themselves as you go through, as you go through a period of discovery. For those of you that are from the 80s and played Super Mario Brothers, the first time you found that warp zone and you could go from level one to level five was amazing. It changed the game for you. You could skip all those levels and move ahead. And sometimes when you figure out those things as a teacher and it really clicks with you, you can move your classroom ahead of those levels and warp zone ahead. Sometimes as a teacher too, it's difficult um, as, I have to remember who's talking about, Amanda. When Amanda was talking about math today and how easy it is to get caught up in the curriculum and the content and really feel the pressure of moving through all that different content and really stifling some of the pedagogy that you know is great, but that content and state standards and all this other stuff is really weighing down on you. And it's hard to see the way forward. So that repetition sometimes can hypnotize you into complacency, where you're not moving through that exploration and that discovery phase that's really important for you as a teacher to move forward. So for each one of my Easter eggs, so there's five because everybody loves lists, if I said, students, here's some great ways for you to study for your test, most of them probably aren't going to read it. But if I say there's five ways for you to study for this test, they're more likely to read it. That blog post that Michelle was mentioning earlier, um, I put out some six tips or six ways that I use Quizlet live in my classroom. If I didn't put the six on there, I'll guarantee you that most people wouldn't read it. But because I had that number on there, it automatically elicits a response where people want to read it because there's a number involved with it. And I'm sure a lot of times when you guys look up things for, your, for teaching, if it says a number, you scroll through the summary at the beginning, that's probably a couple paragraphs, and you wait till you get to that first number, right? And you're like, okay, there's the first thing that this blog was talking about. Same thing with the six tech tools that Michelle brought up. I'll bet any of you that bring up that post from Jennifer Gonzalez, you're gonna scroll to that number one without reading that first part, okay? So with each one of my Easter eggs, um, I'm gonna put up a question, a scenario, that I want you to kind of think about. Then I'm going to talk about that Easter egg that I discovered as a teacher. And then we're going to do a reflection question after each one as well. Okay, just so you know how it's set up as we go. So in your classroom, a student violently rips up tests when he earns a bad grade. What would you do? So I'll let you think on that for a sec. So I know being a teacher, you're probably thinking about, well, what do I know about this student? Right? Do they have any learning disabilities they have to be concerned with? Right? You're thinking about all these different possibilities. But I'm sure you know some teachers that would probably punish that kid right away and yell at them, right? So here's what I did. And this is an Easter egg that I learned along the way. For this specific child, you can imagine in the classroom when this is happening, that all the students are kind of nervous in that situation, right? A student just starts ripping up the test. Oh my gosh, what's the teacher gonna do? And they're all nervous, and the kid ripping up the test is just frustrated with what's going on. Who knows what happened leading up to that test? Maybe it was just the grade, who knows, okay? But in that situation, I realized that every student in my classroom is a character. They all have different attributes that we have to figure out along the way. What are they really good at? What are they not so good at? Where can I level them up to where they're even or a little bit closer to the rest of the kids in my class? What are some of those things that won't level up? There might be th some things that stay the same. So for that particular student, what I ended up doing is the next time I handed out a test, I copied that test five times after he took it. I gave him that first test. He ripped it up like he usually does. And then I pulled out from behind my back that second copy of that test. And what happened at that moment? Everybody started laughing. The kid who was ripping up that test totally brought him back down. 
and he was laughing along with the rest of the kids in class and became part of that situation. Everybody came together at that moment. And then I said to him, you can rip that test up too. It's okay, I know if you need to do that, you go ahead and do that. And then I pulled out the third test. And I let him go until he released that from his system and he was good to go. As a teacher, I was not taking offense that he was ripping up that test. I know that I have to pay attention to the student attributes moving forward. So that's my first Easter egg. So my reflection question for Easter egg one, how do you modify your classroom to incorporate your students' attributes? Do you identify them as separate people? Or are you trying to put them into a cookie cutter classroom where you're trying to get them all into the same place? Because it's not gonna happen. Easter egg two. Several students are struggling with the pace of the class and can't master the content. What do you do? So I know there's some teachers, I'm going to pick on Amanda again, um, who feel the real pressure of that content. And I know it's a real struggle, especially with BAF, when you have to get through all that. Some teachers might just push those kids through. They haven't mastered it, but we covered that content, so we're moving forward. But learning didn't actually happen in that moment, did it? You covered the content, but the students didn't learn anything, and that's really what we're here for, is for student learning. So Easter egg two, I'm gonna talk about power-ups. This is a situation where you as a teacher can multiply yourself. You can become more than one. Amanda is a big part of my talk today, <laughs> and I wasn't planning on it. Um, but when she was talking about recording her lessons, suddenly there's two Amandas. They can see real Amanda, or they can see recorded Amanda. So now we have two math teachers instead of one in that situation. These things also allow me to do self-paced lessons where students can move at the pace of learning. If they're not moving at the pace of their own learning, they're not learning. They're just getting stuff crammed in their face. So with a lot of my lessons, I was able to do that self-paced learning where I built um, things like HyperDocs where the kids could move through it. They knew the order of the lesson. They knew where we were going. And I set up Google Forms where they could do some self-checks along the way. So as a teacher, I didn't have to keep roaming the room where a kid's like, is this right, is this right, is this right? They can check themselves as we go through. And then I can focus on those kids that really need my help in the classroom during that learning. And I'll leave the Netflix up there for you to think about why that fits in there. So use those different power-ups to branch out as a teacher and multiply yourself. So for this reflection, how have you utilized technology to empower your teaching? Like Roger was saying earlier, it's not just sprinkles on top. It should be something that's really an extension of yourself and makes your lessons a lot better and multiplies that teaching ability. Easter egg three, you want students to take a computer test, but are worried about them cheating with the internet. What do you do? So I think I would know Roger's answers to this, and it's my answer, we'll see if it's your answer. Treat the world like it exists. If we're constantly locking everything down for the students, saying there's no cell phones, you can't use the internet, you can't use a calculator, which my teacher in school told me 
I would not have a calculator in my pocket at all times. But I do. But we treat it like it doesn't exist in school. So when those students are taking that test, how about we ask better questions? Instead of just regurgitating information out of a book, let's teach them how to utilize that information to ask bigger questions and to answer them. So when you're making your lesson plans in the future, I would implore you to think about how would the existence of the internet change this lesson? So let's treat it like the calculators exist, internet exists, and my three guys up there are collaboration. Treat it like collaboration exists. In the real world, when professionals are working, when I'm working, I'm talking to Michelle all the time. You talk with each other. Can you imagine a world where an engineer working at a company couldn't look anything up and was not allowed to use a calculator or talk to anyone? That'd be insane. So what steps can you take as an educator to model that real world in your classroom? Request access, no. That's all right. I'll skip this part. It's another tech thing. It's just gonna happen. Um, so this is a video of my son George at 15 months. And you would think some of his first words would be mama, da da. In this case, it's Google. So he's holding uh, the Google Home in my bedroom, and he's saying Google to it at 15 months old. So he almost has the entirety of human knowledge at his fingertips at 15 months old. So how are you going to educate my son in this world? Ask better questions. Treat the internet like it exists. Easter egg four. A teacher has perfected their curriculum into packets that perfectly capture their content. What do you do? Say you're the teacher. I bring this up because I know it's a, it's a pet peeve with Michelle and I. <laughs> She's choking herself in the audience right now. Um, but this was me, actually. I was working towards this. The first years as a teacher, I was inundated with just trying to figure it out. Right? You're trying to figure out how your curriculum fits, how your content fits, how to deal with the kids. There's a whole bunch of other things in the background going on. And you really don't have, you're really just trying to put it together. And for me, that was putting it together in packets. Like, oh, I could put all this information together in one spot. Kids are losing all these different sheets that I'm sending out to them. I put it on one spot, give them the beginning of the chapter, and they're good to go. Like they have that one packet. Everything's together for them, and they're organized. The problem was that, with that was is that I wasn't innovating anymore. I was kind of losing touch with being a teacher at that point. And I needed a spark to move forward. And for me, that happened one summer when I went to an EdTech team event. And then something just clicked with me. And I went, during that summer, I've never done this probably since, but the entire summer, I spent working on the next year. I didn't take time off in the summer after that point. I, was, I had a goal in mind and I knew where I wanted to go. And I haven't stopped since. And that's led me to today, speaking in front of all of you, that led me to actually being able to work as a consultant with EdTech team, which is amazing. Because they're the ones that sparked me to begin with and to be able to actually work for them is an amazing process, and now I'm here working with Michelle at Holland Central School as an edu educational innovator. So it's just been an amazing journey for me to this point. 
So my point of this Easter egg is to always push yourself, be open to change, model that change for the students. Amanda, again, I'm going to get this wrong now. Was it beautiful failure? Beautiful risk, beautiful risk sorry. Risk is different than failure. Um, but taking those beautiful risks and letting the students know that you're taking that beautiful risk. Model that for them. What's that risk look like? Learn along with the students. Say, hey guys, I've never tried this before, but we're going to do it together and figure it out. We always ask our students to be open to that. We're trying to give new experiences to the students. Asking them to be open to failure, because anything we do in class, some of the students might fail at it. But we're asking them to try and to get towards that goal of change. But are you as an educator also opening yourself up to that change as well? The same change that you're asking your students to go through and that same beautiful risk that you're asking them to take, are you taking that beautiful risk as well? So always live in beta. There's always new things happening. There's always new things going on. Both content-wise, which teachers love to do, looking up new content that other teachers are putting out, but also pedagogically. How often have you thought about, okay, this is what I have to teach, but how am I going to teach it? I need to do something different about how I teach this to my students. So it doesn't have to just do with tech. Think about how you're teaching that to your students and what tech might fit how you want to teach that to your students. So when's the last time you took a chance in your teaching? When you felt that nervousness in your gut? I can say that that happened for me today. This is the first time I've talked in front of an audience like this. But I took that chance. And I, I, I wanted to see how it would go. And at the end of this, you'll see I did awesome. Um, so last Easter egg, you found good content from other teachers online, but you want help generating your own ideas. What do you do? So with a lot of teachers, um, I would say, especially coming from a Catholic school, you don't really have a department, per se. So I taught Latin. And I was the only Latin teacher. So who am I going to collaborate with? And I know there's other small schools too like that, where you might be the only teacher for your subject area. You have no one else to bounce ideas off of. Like Amanda said, you could definitely talk to other people in other content areas. Because you all have something to contribute to each other. But if you really want that contact with a grade level teacher, you need to realize that teaching is a multiplayer game. It's not you living with your content in a cave and you shut your classroom door. There are other teachers out there going through the same things that you're going through and they have amazing resources. And the best part is you can talk to them. It's not like when I was in middle school we wrote letters to celebrities hoping for something back. Maybe like 1% of the kids actually got a letter back from somebody. Today, when you post someone's name on Twitter or another platform, you actually get responses back. And it's amazing to me, especially when you do it with some of your heroes, like your, some of your ed tech heroes for me, that they actually talk back to you. Not talk back. That's bad phrasing. Um, but they actually talk to you about what you're, what you're asking about, what the kind of issues that you're interested in. And you can connect with those classrooms around the world. And like Mike showed, you can connect with those classrooms and talk to those kids from around the world and see what's going on in different parts of the country. So recognize that teaching is a multiplayer game. You're not in it by yourself. Keep your door open and see what's out there. So how have you collaborated with and contributed to other teachers? In the beginning, I talked about 
how teachers are really great at finding things online that fit into their classroom, but how are you reaching out and contributing to those other teachers around the world that are so giving to you? You're doing great things in your classrooms, and it's amazing when you post that stuff online and you get feedback on it, and it just pushes you forward more and more because you're realizing that you're more important than you think you are. So the last thing I'm going to do, and I might have to tweak this so it works, because um, we're presenting on the other computer. So what I want you guys to do is you're actually going to be able to post your own Easter eggs. I want to hear what you have to say, because I'm sure that all of you have some amazing things that you're doing in your classrooms, and you have some amazing lessons that you learned along the way. So I want to know what those things are. So I'm going to put up that up there in a minute. Um, and I want you to contribute to that. I'm going to leave that up on the TIFF Talks website so you can always come back to it. So it's not only my five Easter eggs I want you to work with. I want you to work with everybody else's Easter eggs that they're going to post for you. Because teaching is a multiplayer game. And I want you to be relevant. I want you to be open to change. And I want you to make a difference. Thank you.